Today marks a new series, The Kid Who Became a King. We're going to look at the life of David for the next few weeks together. And so I invite you to find your way over to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, if your Bible is kind of like mine, for the last year, it's naturally opened up over to Matthew because we were there for a year. Can you believe it was a year that we spent in Matthew? We had some things in between, but we spent a year in Matthew looking at the five messages of Jesus. But today, we're going to start talking about the life of David. And just to, to look at this area of time and to look at David, you know, we, we're going to see a long span and a long journey, and we're going to see a lot of different things about David. Today, we're going to look at the beginning of David. We're going to look at the moment when he was chosen as the next king. And it was done in an illogical way. It was done in a dangerous way. And we're going to look at that and talk about that. But I want to ask you, have, if you've ever felt overlooked if you've ever felt underheard, if you've ever felt like you don't get a fair share about things in life, then you are in good company because up until this very moment we're going to look at this, David would have felt a lot like this. He'll be referred to as, well, he's the youngest. Which, really, you could also utilize that term and say, well, he's the smallest. Not just in stature, but in the mind of his father. There were rules to this thing. And God was about to break them. And if anybody can break a rule and get away with it, it's God. It ought to be God. And it's going to be God because he breaks rules all the time. He doesn't break his rules. He breaks our rules that we try to put on him. And that's a dangerous place to be, amen? We question things. Samuel's going to question something. He's not going to be certain about this. Samuel also is in a long line of people who question things. We question things. God may be calling you to something and you're like, are you sure about that? God may be asking you to step out onto something and you're going to hesitate for a variety of reasons. You're going to wonder, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure I'm the one. I'm not sure it should be done. But we have to come back to this reality. God, if you want it, let it be. And so we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 today as we see this moment unfold. Now we're going to look at the first 13 verses today and we'll finish the chapter next time. Uh, but today we're going to look at the kid who became a king. Let me read through it, and then we're going we're gonna to talk about it. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, because I have selected a king from his sons. Samuel asked, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. And the Lord answered, Take a young cow with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll let you know what you're to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate to you. Now, I'm going to pause right here, and let's just have a little bit of filler information that goes on. Because the writer here gives us a couple of very interesting phrases that the Lord says to Samuel. I, I found it interesting, and I like to point out interesting things because I think it brings it out to us and makes it real for us. The Lord said to Samuel, I have rejected Saul, but I have selected a king from Jesse's sons. Now, if you recall, the nation of Israel began to beg for a king. We need a king. 
We want a king. Samuel, give us a king. We want a king. We need a king. Everybody else has a king. Why don't we have a king? Well, they have a king, and they have a king, and they have a king. Come on, Samuel, give us a king. Like a four-year-old in, in this toy store. Well, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. Well, Johnny's got this, and Johnny's got that, and Susie's got this, and Bobby's got that. Why can't I have that? Well, everybody else on the block's got the newest PlayStation. Why can't I? It's the same mentality. We want to keep up with everybody else. Here's the thing. Israel had a king. But they wanted a king. You see, they had a king, and that was God. God was their king. It was a theocracy. They wanted a monarchy. They wanted a king they could look at. They wanted a king that they could touch and feel and bow down to. They wanted a king almost as if it were an idol. And so Samuel goes before God, and I don't know what I'm going to do with these people. They want a king. I don't know what the problem is. And he says, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Give them what they want. And they got what they wanted. You know, if you recall, you read back through, it didn't take long for Saul to lose the favor of God. And in that moment, things got real tough. That's where we get into this moment where the Lord says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn? For I've rejected Saul. I've got, a, I've got another one I'm, I'm ready for. I need you to go and anoint him. That's not the way you do things. You don't anoint the next king with the current king on the throne. That's called a coup. That's not what you do. But if you think about it, when the Lord says, I've already rejected Saul as king, in God's mind, that throne was vacant. And he said, I have selected the next one very interesting that that we look at this in, in that way but Samuel he's like I, I can't do this Saul's going to hear about it he's going to kill me think about that Samuel was a powerful figure in this time frame he carried a lot of weight a lot of authority a lot of responsibility Samuel didn't make a lot of moves that Saul didn't know about because Saul was paranoid and he had all kinds of spies everywhere checking up on things and Samuel's like, I can't go do this. He's going to find out. And so God says, go, just take a heifer with you and, and say that you've come to sacrifice. And that's true. He was coming to sacrifice. He was also coming to do something else as well. So verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord directed, and he went to Bethlehem. When the elders of the town met him, they trembled and asked, Do you come in peace? Now that's an interesting thing to ask, isn't it? Why, why would they be fearful? Well, what you may not know is a little bit of the culture and context that's going on. When the prophet would come to a town bringing a heifer with him, it's usually because he's there to investigate a murder. That's true. That, that, that was the tradition. And so the elders are coming out going, huh, um... What's going on? Is there something that you know that we don't know? This, this, this is freaking us out a little bit. Because that's what they assumed. They assumed if Samuel's coming and bringing a, a heifer, with, this something bad's about to happen. He's coming to judge the town to figure out who's in the wrong, who did this, why did they do it, and then prosecute him. That was a part of the process. And he's like, no, 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 no. I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. You know, when I've read through this before, and when I was studying for this, it, it dawned on me. For some reason, and maybe you're, you're the same way, and I was this way, I was this many years old when I figured this out, okay? I, for some reason, had it in my head, maybe you did, that Samuel ended up at Jesse's house, 
and it was just he and Jesse and the boys. Somehow, I apparently didn't read verse 5 all these years because he invited the elders. He said, you get yourself consecrated and you come. Then he went and told Jesse and his sons to consecrate themselves and to come. There's, that's a big gathering. No longer is this going to be an unknown thing. I mean, any time you get that many people together, somebody's talking. Right? You, you can't get that many people together. I mean, that's just the way that works. But somehow, this is what's going to be going on. And so you've got this group that has gathered. So in verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and, and this is the firstborn son, Certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. Samuel was really hoping for an easy-peasy, lemon-squeezy moment, right? He just wanted this thing done. He wanted to get this thing done, get out of town. He was nervous already. He wasn't sure. He was being faithful. He was going to be obedient. My friends, how many times do you follow God, but you've still got that, that nagging feeling of anxiety going on in you? It's like, I know I'm doing what God wants me to do, but man, this, this is really, I'm just, I'm very unsure uh, about this. It's probably the best place you could be. It's because it's in those moments you begin to rely on the Lord more than yourself. When you step into situations that you know the Lord has called you to do, but you're scared to death to do it, that's not a bad place to be. See, our world would say that you need to be confident and you, need to, you, you, just, you just need to do that and, and be okay with My friends, when God's call is on your life, it's not going to be the most satisfying, anxiety-ridden thing. It's going to be fearful. You're going to say, I can't do this. Who am I to do this? I'm not skilled for this. You're going to come up with at least half a dozen other people that would be better at it than you. But it's you God wants. And Samuel looks at him, the firstborn son. This is what's supposed to happen. The firstborn is the one who gets the double portion of inheritance. The firstborn is the one who gets chosen. The firstborn is the one that things happen to. Even on, even on the girl's side, if you remember, it was Leah who got in before Rachel because he said, well, we can't have it the other way around. She's the oldest. I can't have her unmarried while the youngest is already married. We can't have it that way. There was an order to things. And God's stepping outside of the boundaries of that. Verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. What, what's that tell you about Eliab? Just thinking through, reading through the scriptures. Don't look at his appearance. Obviously, he was probably handsome. He's a good looking kid. And don't look at his stature. You, you remember what they, how they described Saul? He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Samuel thinking, okay, we got to get a tall guy. We got we to gotta get a strong guy. Got to get a good looking guy because politically that works for us. How often do we judge a person by the outward appearances of their life? How often are we judging people because they look good or they're tall enough or they're strong enough or all this other? We base it all on the outside stuff. Samuel was too. I think partly because Samuel didn't want to be here in this moment. He still had a fear about him. But secondly, this was the traditional way of doing it. This is just what happens. This is how we do things. But the Lord says to him, Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel, <clears throat> second born. The Lord hasn't chosen this one either, Samuel said. Then Jesse presented Shema, but Samuel said, yeah, the Lord hadn't chosen this one either. 
you, can you feel the awkwardness rising in the room? I mean, you got the elders in town, already don't know what Samuel's up to. Samuel's there, it's, it's a difficult moment. Jesse's bringing all of his sons. He's parading them in in the form and fashion of the day and the culture and saying, here's Eliab, here's Abinadab, here's Shema. And Samuel's just like, yeah, no. Nope. He paused on the first one. I don't get that same hesitation on the second or the third one. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. And the Bible, the next verse can say, and so Jesse presented seven of his sons. Number four, yeah, nope. Number five, nope. Number six, nope, here we go. Number seven, nope, not this one either. I can imagine the stress level is rising in the room. So understand that. So Samuel checks for human error, and in verse 11 he says, Are these all the sons you have? He's just making, because you know, Samuel's now, according to what Jesse's presenting, he's given him all his boys. Jesse's given all his boys he felt worthy to give. Let that sink in a second. He presented all the ones that were worthy of it from a human standpoint. And God said no to every one of them. My friends, when we try to present something before God that looks good to us, it doesn't necessarily look good to God. And just because we think it's worthy on the other side, just because we think something else is unworthy or some person is unworthy, the Lord says, I don't look at all the things you look at. I look at the heart. I look at their motivation. I look at their inner loyalty. I look at their faithfulness. I look at their heart. My friends, God already knew what David would do over in 2 Samuel. And yet, let's see what's happening. They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. But right now, he's tending the sheep. He didn't even get an invite. He didn't get the chance. I can suspect because of the culture and the time. It was dinner the night before. Jesse had heard about this and said, yeah, you, you got to go. Because, you know, the boys have something important to go do. You, you got to go tend the sheep. Now, somebody might want to try to rise and say, well, you know, that was an important job to do. No, it was the scuzzy job to do. The fun job was to go meet with Samuel. That's the fun job. David got the junk job because he wasn't looked upon as worthy. Samuel told Jesse, send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. We're not going to have a meal till we get this thing figured out. The whole point of my presence is that I'm supposed to do this thing, and until this thing gets done, we're not going to eat. If you don't think that'll motivate some guys to get some things done, you know, it, <laughs> we're going to have church conference here after church today, right? And you know, if we'd flip the two things, if we'd have church conference and then have lunch, it, you'd be amazed at how fast we'd get some things done around here. Right? Why? Because that's, that's the way it works, right? Don't worry, that's not what we're going to do. So Jesse sent for him, and he had beautiful eyes and a healthy, handsome appearance. And the Lord said, anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. Then Samuel set out and went to Ramah. You remember when Saul was anointed, what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. You remember what happened when he, when he, when he went through his rejection? The Spirit of the Lord left him. Now the Spirit of the Lord's resting on David. 
God knows what he's doing, even if we don't understand it. So when you look at this story and you look at this moment, I'm going to ask you three questions. The first question is this. When God chooses to do something, will you be faithful? When God chooses to do something, will you be faithful? And this is about sticking to it. And this is about sticking to what God wants you to do. What's your sticky factor with God? Are you sticky sometimes? Are you sticky all the time? What's your sti- I can't open a jar of honey that I don't have it like all over my hands. I mean, it could be a brand new jar of honey. And I, and I've, I, I can wash it off. It could be spick and span clean. I will open that jar up and somehow it's all over. I don't know how that works, but it does. How sticky are you with God? You know, we talk about stick to Are you faithful to the Lord? Do you remain faithful to the Lord? What if He wants to do something new? Are you going to be faithful to the Lord? Samuel was being called to start a transitional process of kings. What's he asking of you to do? What's he asking you personally to do? What's he asking us as a church to do? Are we going to be sticky? Are we going to be faithful to what the Lord wants from us and for us? Because it can be difficult. That's a yes or no question in the notes if you're keeping score at home. When God chooses to do something, will you be faithful? Is that a yes or no? The second question is this. When God chooses an illogical path, will you follow Him? When God chooses an illogical path, will you follow Him? Eliab was the clear choice. Eliab was the clear choice. And if not Eliab, then Abinadab has to be the clear choice. Then Shema has to be the clear. And then 4, 5, 6, and 7 don't even get named. They're not the choice. That's weird. When God called Samuel to go and anoint the next king, he's like, that's not how we do that. God, come on. I'm going to die doing it. He will kill me for this. This is illogical. It doesn't make any sense. When the perfect Lamb of God died on the cross because you couldn't do it and asks you to believe in what He already did for you as payment for the whole totality of the sinful life of you, of you, it's hard to understand that. That doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. I have to earn my way. i got to pay my dues. i got to pay my way. i got to do more right than wrong. i got to have a scale of balance and I've got to keep putting... No, my friends, you have to simply, by faith, accept the grace of God through the activity and the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. That's why it's called faith, not logic. It's faith. You have to trust it. You have to believe it. So when God chooses to do something illogical, are you going to follow? I'm sure that David also didn't completely understand what was going on. Why me? Why now? You know, I I don't understand. This doesn't make this doesn't make any sense. God doesn't have to make sense to us. In fact, if you think that all the way through, if God always made sense to us, He's not God anymore. And if your God makes sense to you, it's not the true one God of the universe. It's a God of your own making, and that's called idolatry. I don't understand all of God. You can't understand all of God. He's too big. He's too big. So when he asks you to do something off the wall, illogical, are you going to do it? That's a yes or no. Well, no, I don't know. I want to think. I want to no. know. We don't have the luxury of time to sit and try to negotiate with God. It's either a yes or a no. 
We're either going to be faithful or we're not. We're either going to follow or we're not. What is it that you're going to do? And the third question is this. When God chooses you to do something, will you answer the call? When God a- asks you to lead something, will you answer the call? Well, I'm, I'm just one in a million. I'm just one of many. Yeah. And that's when all the excuses come out. I'm not skilled. It's not me. I can't do that. You know, I took a spiritual gifts test in 1976, and it didn't tell me that I could do that, so I'm not sure that I can. Don't put all your eggs in a spiritual gift assessment. Put your eggs in prayer and Bible study before a holy God and just answer the call. I love assessments. I'm a data-driven strategy thinker. I love assessments. I love data. I love putting it all together, putting it in a spreadsheet, and putting pie graphs. I love that stuff. So I'm not against assessments. I'm not against data. But I am still going to fall before a holy God and say, okay, this is what the data says, but what do you want? What do you want? And God's either going to reveal to you through the data that you've, you've done a confirmation on what you want, on what he wants you to do, or he's going to reveal to you something different and challenge your faith moment. Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to follow? Are you going to answer the call? David needed to answer the call. Samuel first. He had to answer the call. Samuel, I need you to go and do this. You know, the beginning of Samuel is an interesting story. You should go back and read it. Samuel, Samuel, runs over to Eli. Did you call me? No, go back to bed. Samuel, Samuel, Eli, what you want? I didn't call you. In fact, the next time you hear that, how about you say this? Speak, Lord, for your servant's listening. Samuel, Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant's listening. He never got over that. So why do we? Don't get over that. Don't get over your salvation. Don't get over your call. Well, I'm not called to ministry. You're called to something. I have stood here and said that for five years. You are called to something. Are you doing the thing you're called to do? Whatever it may be. I'm called to preach and pastor. What are you called to do? I will tell you this. When you answer the call, it'll be the scariest time of your life and the most satisfying time of your life all wrapped up together. You're going to go through times where it's the most frustrating job you've ever had, but it's the most joyful moment you've ever had in your life. Why? Because it's illogical, it doesn't make any sense, but God called me to that and this is what I'm doing and I can't think of doing anything else. I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm talking about being whatever it is God called you to be too. What is it? Is it an educator? Is it a doctor? Is it a dentist? Is it a garbage collector? What is it? What is it you've been called to do inside and outside of the church world? What are you called to do? Well, I've never thought about that. Start! The reason you may have no joy in your heart and your life is because you're not where God's called you to be. The reason why you are sour all the time is because you're not where God's called you to be. You're where you want to be, not where God wants you to be, and now you're, you're upset about it. So when he chooses you, will you be faithful? When he chooses you, will you follow? When he chooses you to act or to lead in something, will you answer the call? Those are three yes or no questions. You don't get to put a question mark beside that and go, I'm going to circle back to that later. No. It's yes or no. Right now, it's yes or no. And so here's the thing. If you have all three yeses to that, praise God. Now you need to pray for direction. 
Because if you are willing to be faithful and to follow and you're willing to answer the call, then you need to pray in the next few moments as we are going to stand and sing in just a second. You need to pray, God, what do you want me to do? He's either going to confirm what you're already doing as what he wants you to do, or he's going to give you, if you're honest and willing to hear it, he's going to tell you what he wants you to do, and then he's going to challenge your yeses. But here's the thing, if one of those answers was a no, and you were honest with that, because you know we're not turning this in, if one of those you answered a no, or if one of those you wrote a yes beside so your neighbors thought better of you, but in your heart it's a no, hello, but in your heart it's a no, You need, to, you need to pray before a holy God in the next few moments and have him reveal to you what are you holding on to that's holding you back? What's, what are you holding on to that's holding you back? I read a thing the other day and it was about working out and I thought it applied to this moment right now. You can be sore tomorrow or you can be sorry tomorrow. Which do you want to be? I would rather be sore tomorrow because I did the things God demanded of me today than to wake up tomorrow and say, and be sorry for not engaging what God wants me to do. What are you going to choose? All three yeses? Pray for direction and clarification and clarity and confirmation. You got to know in there somewhere. Doesn't matter which one. You got to know in there somewhere. You need to take these moments. You probably already know what you're holding on to that's holding you back. Are you willing to confess that before God? Are you willing to lay that on the altar before God? Are you ready to, to write that down in in your notes and say, this is what I got to give up. This is what I need to give to the Lord. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, but I get it. This is holding me back. The devil's had me too long in this particular area, and I've got to let it go. I've got to confess before God. My friends, we have to stop thinking about a candy cane luxury moment of, oh yeah, oh God, I'm sorry. No, we've got to fall before a holy God and humble ourselves and say, I am wrong in this moment. I am sinful, i got to confess to you because I am wrong, I'm out of touch, I'm out of the moment, I'm out of joy, and God, I confess to you because only God can restore the joy of that salvation. So you, like David, would sing about later, search me and test me and try me to see if there's anything within me that I need to give up. What about you? It's time We don't have time to waste. We don't have time to play. We have to come back into that right moment before God. What are you holding on to that's holding you back that we need to give over to the Lord through a moment of confession and repentance? See, we try to put confession and repentance on a salvation moment. We forget that that's also a regular thing we should be doing. Confession and repentance. It's been a while since we've done that. Let's go.